This is Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. This is Arab Talk with Justin Jamal. I'm Jess Ghanem. And this is Jamal Dejani. Jamal, we have an outstanding show today and um, so much to cover, both domestically and internationally. But I think I want to begin with the an incredible interview between Jonathan Swan, who's a senior political analyst for Axios, and Jared Kushner, who was this, who's one of the senior aides to uh, President Donald Trump. This was an extraordinary interview with Jared Kushner. It happened last week. And if people didn't really understand the gravity of the concerns that you and I have about his complete and utter incompetence, racism, and colonial mentality about Palestine and the Palestinians, if you doubted us, if you didn't believe us, if you felt like we were maybe embellishing or overstating some of our concerns about this complete uh, rejection of history and of decency and common sense that we believe you know, is necessary to carry on any kind of negotiation, and Jared Kushner doesn't have that clearly. If you doubted us for a second, watching, reading, and listening this Axios interview between jo- Jonathan Swan and Jared Kushner will completely get you to understand where we're coming from because this was an extraordinary interview, Jamal. This is an interview where, in fact, uh, Jared Kushner um, said many blatantly colonial, you know, things from a colonial mentality, from a completely racist point of view. Net, net. Um, he doesn't believe that the Palestinians are capable of uh, governing themselves. And he believes that peace its re- in the Middle East is really now peace, Jamal. It's about bringing economic uh, promises of improving the economic life about Palestinians. And Palestinians are not really interested, according to Jared Kushner, Jamal, about peace, about dignity, about their inalienable rights towards their land historically. They're more interested in money. So this is the Jared Kushner perspective. And I think what I'd like to do today is basically break down for our listeners this extraordinary interview. Um, And uh, we'll go through. One other quick thing, Jamal. The deal of the century, again, looks like it's going to get delayed again because it's supposed to come out today. This is the Eid. This is the day after Ramadan, two days after the end of Ramadan, the big celebration, Eid Mubarak, to all of our listeners who are celebrating the Eid right now. It's going to be delayed again. And Mike Pompeo, our Secretary of State, has publicly said that he no longer has confidence that the Middle Eastern peace plan deal of the century is going to be successful. That's right. And actually, you've said quite a bit so Sorry we about have that. To kind of, uh, Let's get down deeper. It, yeah, uh, break it down, get into the weeds of the issue. And I have to say, first of all, because when we talk about Jared Kushner, and you've been always talking about Jared Kushner, so I give you a lot of credit in talking about his incompetence for the past two years. And, of course, uh, uh, talking about uh, that at some point he will be getting indicted because of uh, corruption, graft, and other issues, right? But uh, most people, and, and when we talk about now this big interview on Axios, on HBO, by the way, most people have only watched a short sound bites of this interview, Jess. And the sound bite of this interview focused primarily on President Trump. So, right. so there was the famous uh, question by Jonathan Swan, and I have to give Jonathan Swan a lot of credit and, and kudos to him for asking the right questions. So the, the, the soundbite that people watch was when he asked him, you know, about President Trump, wh- Trump whether he was a racist. Right. And I'm paraphrasing here a little bit. Have you ever seen him say or do anything that you would describe as racist or bigoted. And so Jared Kushner, you know, initially said, so the answer is uh, no, absolutely not. 
and he went on and then he was asked the bomb shell question <laughs> was birtherism racist and the answer from Jared Kushner was, mm, look, I wasn't really involved in that. Wait a minute. He, yeah, Let's is, look at that. So when he was asked, and for, for, for our listeners who don't know something about birtherism, and this is basically the racist movement that Trump adopted before, way before right. he ran for president, questioning the citizenship of President Barack Obama. But not just the citizenship, where he was born. Yeah. Well, basically saying he wasn't. Ma- exactly. And making up stories that he wasn't born in Hawaii and that he was Kenyan because of his father. Of course, this would not would have never happened to any other candidate except because Barack Obama is African-American. Exactly. So Trump, even after President or former President Barack Obama showed a copy, which is, I've never seen any single candidate or any president do that before, showed a copy of his birth certificate. He was also saying that this was forged. So he he kept that lie right. going on for the longest time, including till after actually he became president, he kept, kept on with that story. So this is what's birtherism, by the way, so, you know, for those who don't know. And so when he was asked about birtherism, he acted like a 13-year-old confused kid saying that he wasn't involved. I don't know about that. But can we just say something, Jamal? And when everyone tells you birtherism is racism. For, listen, it's a yes-no question. You don't have to be that bright to answer a yes-no question. Is birtherism a racist construct. It, you either say yes or no. And of course, he because gave, also in the context, the context was, it's not just a racism con- uh, construct, but the context was to question the first African-American candidate or president right. later on, even continued. Yeah. Up till today, by the way, those people who, uh, you know. Still don't believe. They still don't believe. They believe he but was born anyway, in Kenya. Uh, and then he 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 just looked like a, a deer with the headlights in his eyes, and then he couldn't answer that question. He couldn't say yes or no, and he was asked about what three times uh, to kind of clarify, and he just like was stunned, couldn't answer, showed the incompetence that we have been talking about for a long time. So this was I was just going to say this was the soundbite that most people saw. So most people, maybe then they saw another soundbite, but they didn't see just the entire interview. Which I recommend that people see the entire interview. So the entire, of course, interview, you know, talked about the Trump administration, talked about many issues. But then, you know, some of the stuff that we will be talking about, it talked about the his work, really. I mean, he's he's supposedly the guru of the Middle East and the guru of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and the one that uh, was anointed by Donald Trump as if, you know, Jared couldn't solve the issue between Palestinians. Then nobody can. And Israelis, then no one right could. And so when he was asked, and this is the the many things that we want to talk about, about the questions about um, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and then why we said, A, incompetence, and two, colonial mentality. So when he was asked whether Palestinians can run gov- their, govern themselves, what did he say? Well, to me, Jamal, this was really the most interesting uh, among the many things that Jared Kushner said. He uh, was asked specifically about the Palestinians and whether or not the Palestinians can, in fact, govern themselves. And um, he gave a long-winded, convoluted answer that basically said, No, (laughs) the Palestinians cannot govern themselves, but he said it in such an insulting way, more along the lines of the following. Palestinians are basically not interested in governing themselves. They're more interested in financing and money and being able to economically, you know, survive. So we're not interested in allowing the Palestinians and governing themselves because they can't, but we're going to give them economic opportunities because Jared Kushner said the Palestinians that I spoke with, and I want to know who they are, by the way, the Palestinians I spoke with 
are really interested in having enough money to take care of their families. Now, it's, it's a racist answer. It's an insulting answer. It's an answer that does not reflect the reality of 99.99% well, of Palestinians, it's, it's not also, just, it's not also, just in Palestine. It also reflects on his colonial mentality. Precisely. Because this is what the Brits said about uh, African countries. This is what they said about India. This is what they said about the con- countries they occupied in the Middle East. The whole concept that, you know, those nations are not qualified to run their own affairs. But that's, and therefore, we have to occupy them. But, but that's also the American foreign policy. That is the colonial mentality. That was the idea that that's one of the mentalities that the Americans had when they decided to invade Iraq, when they decided to invade Afghanistan, when they have done all of their exploits in Latin America. It was basically a similar kind of mentality, which is, Jamal, we, the colonial power, Britain, France, U.S., whatever, we know better than the indigenous people. Exactly. This is the we know better. We can run your own. We can run your lives. Your lives for and, you. And we can even tell you, this is, the, this is the Kushner idea, Jamal, the Kushner idea that he actually spelled out with uh, Jonathan Swan in the Axios interview is, we know what's best for the Palestinians, and the Palestinians don't want peace. They just want money. They want money. That's basically what this he said. This is the message. Now, delving deeper, and again, we're delving into this interview. We're talking about things that people didn't see on TV unless you watch the entire interview on HBO, not just the sound bites about Trump. And this is a sensitive question, and only Swan or Jonathan Swan can ask because Jonathan Swan also is um, Jewish. Yeah. So he's not going to be accused of anti Semitism or labeled, labeled as a anti-Semite. an anti-Semite and so forth. So this is a very important question that he asked. And he said, Jonathan Swan to uh, Jared Kushner. Well, and I'm quoting here, I'm reading this, so I, I don't want to make any mistakes in uh, yeah. the content. Make sure you get it right. Well, you are, f- frankly, I mean, to look at it from their point of view, meaning the Palestinians, and you're a businessman, you always look at things from their view. You've got three Orthodox Jews on the negotiating team. Two of you have a different points funded. Two of you have at different points funded settlements, Jewish settlements in the West Bank. You've got the actions you've taken so far, moving the U.S. embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. You've got all, you've got all aid to Palestinians, including hospitals in East Jerusalem, and you've shut down the Palestinian diplomatic office in Washington. I mean, can you not see why they might not want to talk to you and that they might not trust you? That's the question of Jonathan Swan. Brilliant question that he asked uh, Jared Kushner. And Jamal, would you please do me the honor of reading Jared Kushner's response, which is truly disgusting? I, I'll paraphrase it if you want. Well, no, no, we have it because we have the transcript right in front of us here. Yeah. So, so his response, uh, you know, I'm reading from the transcript. All right. So there is a difference between the Palestinian leadership and the Palestinian people. Okay. So Jared Kushner knows about the Palestinian people more than we know about the Palestinian right. people. Of, of course, course he does. Of so course he, he does. So he knows, he knows now the difference between the leadership, which, by the way, the leadership that has been for many years buttressed and supported by the United States. Exactly. Against against the will of most of Palestinians who did not choose to be with the, uh, the Palestinian Authority or, or did not agree to support the Oslo Agreement. So now Jared Kushner is lecturing us that he knows the Palestinian people more than they know themselves. Of course. Right? So, so he says, uh, you know, the actions we've taken were because America's aid is no entitlement. So Palestinians had that this this is entitlement, right? Right. Right. If we uh, make certain decisions which we are allowed to as a sovereign nation to respect the rights of another sovereign nation and we get criticized by that government, the response of this president is not to say, oh, let me give you more aid. So, again, that was a result of the decision taken by the Palestinian leadership. With regards to the Palestinian people, uh, do I believe that they want to have a better life? And I do think that they're, go- they're not going to judge 
and he goes on to talk about basically that Palestinians are looking for money, money, or right. um, looking at the economy more than that they're looking to so govern let, let, themselves. So let's break that down a little bit, Jamal. First of all, he doesn't answer a question. Jonathan Swan's question was, why should the Palestinians trust you? Why should they trust you? Why should they trust Jonathan Green, Greenblatt? Well, he's saying it point, point blank, not only, I mean, and that's why I said kudos to him because Jonathan Swan is Jewish, so he is entitled to ask this question and he, he's not going to get criticized like someone else would get criticized. However, that it wasn't about, your, your, you know, he's, he did say you, there are two Orthodox Jews and another Jewish person talking on behalf of the Palestinians and negotiating on their behalf. But that wasn't the main issue. The main issue is two of you support settlements. illegal colonial settlements, and you want to be the brokers of peace? So rather than ask, rather than answer, Jamal, the direct question, why would the Palestinians trust you? The easy answer, the more honest answer, the more genuine answer is they shouldn't trust us. Why would the Palestinians trust us? Because we've screwed them for, you know, 71 years. Why should the Palestinians trust us? That would have been the honest answer. But he doesn't answer the question. He gives a fake answer. He is free associating and basically saying he blamed the Sulta. He blamed the Palestinian Authority. Which, again, we're the first. The United to do. <laughs> States helped. Create, create right and, so and train and train their security forces to protect the Israeli colonial right. settlements. And then he had the audacity and paid for their salaries. And then he had the audacity to say, Jamal, that the Palestinians somehow don't really care about dignity, respect, sovereignty, uh, the dignity and right that they have, which is undeniable, to speak on their own behalf and to you know run their own affairs. Rather, the pal all the pal again, all the Palestinians, uh, they care about his money. So this is not just a colonial mentality, Jamal, the colonial mentality of we know what's best for the Palestinians. We will tell the Palestinians what they want and what is best for them. It's not just that, it, which is deeply insulting and deeply rooted in, a, in the colonial mentality, but it's, it's fundamentally racist. And going back... <laughs> You know, we can take this interview line by line. Which I think we should, but yeah, we well, don't have we time. Well, we don't have time, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, for this. But also, if you look at it as, as a whole, which I think it was very important, aside from all the holes that we have kind of uh, noticed, but it really defines the persona of Jared Kushner. Absolutely. It also show his exposes his incompetence the man cannot even lie as a politician, which we know that he was lying, but he is so transparent. At his lies. At his lies. He panics. He doesn't know how to answer semi, I would say, tough questions or not even tough they're questions. Not, they're not tough they're questions. yes and no. He just kind of like free associates goes all over the place. And, and you, you look at him and say, is this the senior advisor of the president of the United States? Yes, it is. Is this the man in charge to of the Middle East, of portfolio. The Middle East portfolio and our foreign policy there? Yes, yes, it is. And that is shocking. And I think, I mean, this has been probably one of the worst interviews that I've seen of any politician, and I've seen many well, I would say Jamal was and, one of the— And I, I, made him look like, really, an incompetent child, really. But Not I even an adult. He didn't speak like an adult. But I would say, it, for me, it was one of the best interviews ever given. Because the amount of criticism that you and I have received about our questioning Jared Kushner's bona fides— Aside, aside from nepotism. Aside from nepotism, I mean, we have been criticized— for criticizing his incompetence, criticizing him for being incompetent. He's Harvard, he's this, he's that. Well, we, we know that the story behind Well, We all Harvard. know the story about Harvard. But here, and if you just read the transcript, Jamal, which is disturbing by itself, but when you see the video and you see 
as you say, the deer in the headlight look, the, the hemming and the hawing, the complete fabrication, the inability to answer the question. It is truly a portrait in cowardice, incompetence, colonial, uh, colonial mentality, and just flat out racism. And this is the person at the helm. Now, things are so bad with the Middle East peace process, Jamal. And, 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 and actually, again, I want to go back to Jonathan Swan. He was a real journalist. He asked tough because questions. Because these are the questions that are not asked. No one asked. These are the yeah, questions, even exactly. when you point to his involvement, his personal involvement to supporting racist colonial settlers. I think that was the first time it was and asked. Also, talking about the second man in charge who is the U.S. ambassador to Israel, also for years supported illegal colonial settlements that his daughter, which wasn't in, that his daughter actually lives on these settlements and she made Alia, so she's an Israeli citizen who is subject to serving on, in the Israeli military. I mean, just that at, alone is enough is enough to say, well, how can you have a fair... I mean, think about it, just in our legal system. If you and I have a dispute over a piece of real estate, you know, over a property that I bought from you or vice versa, and we go in front of the judge, Jess, and the judge owns a piece of the property... At the same time. <laughs> or is, has, in, is, has an investment in the property. Right. Or he has been paying something towards that property. And he's the judge. What, what's, he'll recuse himself, right? This is the law. Yeah, this 100%. Is, this is 100% of the law. But, but these guys have vested interests, just like not any different than Sheldon Adelson, who who finances these set settlers. These guys have been financing settlers in Hebron and other areas. Yeah. And they're put in charge to neg negotiate with the Palestinians. How stupid do they think the word is? Well, well, that's part of the colonial mentality, Jamal, I think. And, um, you know, I want to echo what you just said about Jonathan Swan. I think Jonathan Swan should be given uh, a lot of praise and kudos to him for for actually asking really honest, tough questions. I think that's the first time someone has, in, in this kind of forum, has actually called out Jared Kushner for his support of settlements, for being a, a supporter of the settlement. And you know the other thing that Jonathan Swan did in this interview? There's this obvious thing that we've talked about ad nauseum, Jamal. And you, you, you referred to it. Here we have a peace plan negotiation with two parties, the Palestinians and the Israelis, and there are no Palestinians involved in the talks. I, I, uh, yes, there is one. No, but I'm just saying. I mean, I, I mean but ju I'm just saying right now. Exactly, Palestinians. Uh, you know, for the first time, because before this is again the road that led to this disaster. I call it the road to Oslo. Yeah, the road to disaster. Right. The Nakba after the Nakba, the Naksa after the Naksa <laughs> is this whole Oslo thing that the Palestinian leadership have been drinking the cool aid of Oslo that now that cool aid turned into poison. It it's is poison. poison to the Palestinian people. And we're realizing it because after this long, long kind of uh, hodgepodge trip, we're being told, hey, forget about the two state solution. We're going to talk about enhancing your economy. And we're going to have an economic summit in Bahrain. Bahrain. So when you said no one is participating, and we have to clarify, there is one Palestinian, at least as of today, who will be going. And uh, he's, uh, again, I would call him, he's a sidekick uh, to uh, Jared Kushner, uh, you know, from the Palestinian side. And his name is Ashraf al-Jabari. Uh, Where someone, does he live? Some, well, he basically lives uh, on the side of Hebron, which is under Israeli control and where the settlers live. So he's pretty much protected by, by, the, the, Israelis. by the Israelis. So he's the only one. And, and again, this guy, have, this guy has been rejected by his family. He's been called a traitor by many. He has even been, the Sultan has he, rejected him. He has been him. implicated uh, 
Well, he has a history. By the way, he was part of the, uh, when we say the Sulta, just to our listeners, he refers to the Palestinian Authority. Uh, he was part of the security forces at one point. Uh, his brother was the governor of uh, Hebron. And then I don't know how he made his money, but we can guess. And so he's <laughs> now uh, called a, a, a Palestinian businessman. So he is the only person. He has a very, very, very dubious uh, MO, let's say. So he's going to Bahrain? And he's the only Palestinian who has accepted uh, this invitation if, in fact, that conference uh, will be it, held. It may know? not even happen. Well, we know that um, the leaders of the Palestinian Authority have, uh, whom we have been very uh, critical of Jamal over the years for all the reasons, you know, for all the obvious reasons, have been very critical for their incompetence in terms of negotiating on behalf of the Palestinians. Even the Sulta is not going to be going to this thing. We have uh, King Abdullah has declined going. We have basically every single Arab leader except MBS and maybe uh, the ruler in Bahrain. I don't, and I think maybe MBZ is going, the, uh, the crown prince of UAE. So in terms of the broad reach of the Arab world that is supposed to bring this global peace plan and economic revivement uh, to the Palestinians, uh, no one's on board with this. I mean, uh, King Abdullah, who's clearly, despite all the criticisms uh, that, that are well-deserved for his role, even King Abdullah, who's considered a big ally of the United States and, you know, to some extent uh, has been not an antagonist to the Israelis by any stretch of the imagination, even King Abdullah has rejected this plan. This is not a peace plan, Jamal. We've said this for such a long time. It is a plan for apartheid. It is a plan to subjugate Palestinians so that they can go along the model of uh, being enslaved for making products that will be sold globally and distributed by Israeli companies or Palestinian-Israeli co-ops that will come together. This has nothing to do with sovereignty. This has nothing to do with righting the wrong of the catastrophe of 1948. It has nothing to do with the right of return for refugees. It has nothing to do with international law. This is the grand Kushner peace plan. Even Mike Pompeo, our Secretary of State, said this week, Jamal, he does not expect this plan to be successful and would not be surprised if the economic summit in Bahrain uh, doesn't happen. So, Jared Kushner, where are you? Um, what's going on? This is the day after the Eid, two days after. You're supposed to unveil the plan. I hear a rumor that Benjamin Netanyahu is having some difficulties right now. It's <laughs> just a rumor. Uh, but we predicted this two years ago, Jamal. I mean, I don't want to say I told you so to our to our listeners because, you know, that's not nice. But we predicted the, the demise uh, of the Kushner-Trump Greenbat peace plan many years ago. And, of course, it was going to be a disaster. And so we're going, uh, you know, we're going to look at some of the questions again, some of the answers. Here's another one, Jonathan Swan asking Jared Kushner. I want to set aside the Israeli-Palestinian peace deal for a moment. I'll come to particulars about that later. I want to ask you about what you, Jared Kushner, believe. Do you believe the Palestinian, I mean, do you believe the Jewish people have a God-given right to what the Israeli government called Judea and Samaria and what others called the West Bank? That's the question to so, him. So, by the way, Jamal, that's a yes-no question. You know, Yes or no? So Do you Jared believe Kushner's it? answer, so what I believe is that all human beings have the right to live in a way that gives them the opportunity to live in peace and to live harmoniously with each other. When I first got involved, I saw that there was a big difference between the older and then, and then he, got, he gets interrupted by Swan and says, sorry, just to pin you on that thought, Judea and Samaria is a set piece of land. Do you think that the Jewish people have a right to that land, a God-given right? Kushner answers, 
my job it's not about what i believe it's about what the president wants to push and for uh, push for and what you can get both sides to agree to that will be in a way that will allow them to live better lives then he get, gets him to push him again on this question because we know that this is Jared Kushner and his family have been supporting Israeli colonial settlers for, for many, many years financially. And they believe that this is their God-given right. So he was kind of trying to weasel his way out of this question it's, and saying it's not on me, it's on the president. But Jamal, can I tell you what Jared Kushner believes? I'll tell you what Jared Kushner believes. And I have no problem saying this because I'm basing it on his actions. I'm basing it on his previous statements. Jared Kushner does not believe that Palestinians have a right to live in Palestine. In fact, Jared Kushner does not even believe that Palestine exists. He does not believe that there is a, a geographic location referred to as the West Bank, which should be for Palestinians. He believes that entirety of historic Palestine is part of Judea and Samaria. That's what he believes, Jamal. Why can't Jared Kushner just be direct? By the way, this is Arab Talk on KPOO. We're at 89.5 FM, and we're in San Francisco. We're streaming live on KPO.com and streaming live on Facebook Live at Jamal Dejani too. Jamal, this seems like a very easy question. Do you believe? What do you believe about Judea and Samaria? What do you believe? By the way, do, do you have the quote there about, because Jonathan Swan also asked him about Trump's position on abortion rights. Yeah, that's yeah, that's right. Because he gave a very brilliant answer about whether or not he believes basically that Roe v. Wade should be overturned and whether or not a woman has a right to, you know, self-determination over their own bodies. Jared Kushner's brilliant answer for that is I'm I wasn't part of that decision. <laughs> Well, th th that's the same answer that he said when he was asked uh, about birtherism. That's not part of my portfolio. That's not part of, yeah, I wasn't involved in this. I'm not involved in that decision. When they asked him about abortion rights, I'm not involved in that decision. When they asked him about all of these issues having to do with kind of, you know, basic fundamental rights of individuals, um, that uh, obviously President Trump and the Trump administration has gone against, Jared Kushner's response is, I wasn't part of that decision. Well, I, we urge our listeners and viewers to check out the entire Work. interview. It's at X, is that at HBO or at Axios? Yeah, I mean, if you have HBO, you can watch it live there, but the transcript actually, which is very important to look uh, again and again at these questions and answers, uh, you could just uh, Google it uh, and, and look for the interview of uh, Jonathan Swan, Jared Kushner on Axios and slash HBO. You can pull the whole document and look at it. It's really amazing. To me, what's uh, really amazing is that, that this individual is in charge of the entire Middle East portfolio. And just like I said, aside from how you feel about him or not, it was a very terrible interview to actually for the administration to put him, but just the way he was reacting to the questions, the way he was freezing like a deer, the way he was uh, waffling on his answers. So whoever, whoever thought that this was a brilliant idea to have Jared Kushner go in front of this a uh, real journalist, Jonathan Swan, his handlers who agreed to this, Jamal, I have a recommendation. Maybe they should be fired uh, because this this was actually, or applauded, I guess, depending on which way you look at it, this was absolutely one of the most embarrassing kind of uh, revelations because I will say what this is, the truth about Jared Kushner. He's incompetent. That's the truth. Right. Was revealed. We had a revelation. The truth about Jared Kushner was, in fact, re revealed uh, in it, all of its brutality. But Jamal, I think we need to stick on the. I want to stick here on the on the on the on the area of the Middle East for a minute because 
Speaking of colonial mentality, racism, and Islamophobia, maybe we should talk a little bit about the Trump policy on the the policy on Iran. That's right. And how it differs from the policy in North Korea, okay? Because it's kind of interesting to me because you have uh, the North you have North Korea run by, you know, arguably one of the most vicious, brutal dictators in the world, to put it kindly. By the way, Kim Jong un uh, executed the <laughs> North Korean negotiating team for the Trump Kim Jong un summit to cut to bring together a deal. Apparently there were three or four people that were part of the negotiating team. He had them um he had them uh, executed because of their failure. So this is the Kim Jong un uh, negotiating strategy. We know that after all of that, after he test fired the missiles, what happened? Donald Trump's comment was, I trust Kim Jong un. My people are angry well, at this. Even, he even uh, quotes him when he, Kim Jong un, uh, criticizes an American vice, uh, former vice president and a candidate, Joe Biden. Yeah. And basically. Uh, he quoted him, yeah. Yeah, he quoted him. But here is, here is the thing. So uh, you have two reports, Jess. Uh, there is a confidential UN report, which uh, its content uh, uh, has been leaked, uh, about North Korea's global distribution of missile technology and chemical weapons. And it says that they continue doing so even after the, uh, the so-called rapprochement right. by Trump and so on. Uh, you know, they've been distributing uh, nuclear weapons, I mean, not nu I mean uh, chemical weapons, and they've been distributing uh, missiles. And they have a footprint in Syria uh, with the Syria arm arms deals and, and also the civil war in Basically, Yemen. they're a bad actor. Yeah, so they're playing this game. At the same time, the U.S. intelligence report shows that all the evidence point to that Iran is abiding by the JCPOA, which is basically the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. That's the Iran nuclear deal. Which is basically the Iran agreement, Iran right. nuclear deal agreement. And that they have not violated it. They have sticking to all the agreement, what it says, um, you know, they're limiting their, uh, their uh, ballistic missiles range to 1,243 miles or 2,000 kilometers, according to the agreement. There are no indications that they are enriching uranium and whatever. This is our own intelligence. This our is people. This is our, our people. people. They're telling you this. But at the same time, we're seeing this love fest between Trump and and uh, Kim, Kim Jong Un, yeah, and at this and the vilification of Iran, and and so you know from a strategic point of view, and even because you know you have all these uh, American intelligence agencies, and they're saying, you know, Iran is not doing anything wrong. We're not seeing a threat coming out of Iran. Right. Yeah, we have issues. Maybe they're supporting Hezbollah, but that's, that's with Syria. They're, maybe they're engaged in Syria, but they are not posing a threat to other neighboring countries. No, and they're, they're kind of going along, with the, the, they're or, going along with the deal. the United States. Right. And meanwhile, we're seeing basically, and we have no control, by the way, like talking about the sanctions, and this is another thing. They, they're saying that the, san the sanctions have worked against Iran because we have cooperating countries right. who are overseeing the sanctions. You know, in other words, NATO, the Europeans, and other players that if and when Iran violates we its will know. agreement, they, we will know. However, there is no way for us to enforce any type of sanctions against North Korea because we're alienating China. Right. I mean, with this war, the trade war and so forth, China is not going to listen to us. Why should they listen to us? And that's the only country and the most important country for the survival of North Korea. And China is just kind of playing a game. Said, OK, you want to play this uh, trade war with us? We'll, we'll show you how. So, so nothing that North Korea needs 
uh, have been stopped basically. Nothing. Uh, because uh, business is as usual between it and China, and we are alienating China. So no enforcement there. Enforcements are working against Iran, and yet we're screaming, and we got all the national security advisor crying and saying, we must do something about Iran, and we must do something about so, Iran. So, I so have, why is this? I have news for you, Jamal. Because um, the policy in Iran basically has nothing to do with the U.S. strategic interests. The policy in Iran has nothing to do with U.S. economic interests, with U.S. political interests. Our policy in Iran is driven by, directed by, written by, and supported by the government of Israel and Benjamin Netanyahu. Let's be clear about it. The Iran policy under Trump is the Netanyahu policy. The, and, and Jamal, you remember this. Remember this? How many years ago when uh, Bibi Netanyahu went to the United Nations with his inf infamous bomb uh, you know, slide showing the Iran? I mean, it was, it was embarrassing, the kind of PowerPoint slide. And Not PowerPoint. It's a show and tell. It was a show and tell. It was embarrassing. This was eight years ago, him talking about the greatest existential threat to the world was Iran. He says that every year well, at by the, the United way, Nations. Recently, they also said that they've obtained documents or the Mossad obtained documents like the Iranians are so stupid from the secret vault. But that was those those are documents from years ago, Jamal. It's a joke. It's a joke. So basically, the only reason John Bolton is screaming at the top of his lungs is because the Israelis are telling Jonathan uh, are telling uh, uh, Bolton how high to jump. Well, this is uh, all well, about Bolton well, and we about also the have, uh, not just the Israelis. We we also have to be consistent. Saudi Arabia is doing the same. thing. Well, I was going to say that next. It's the Israeli Saudi belief somehow that um, they can coerce the U.S. or tell the U.S. how to direct their interests towards Iran. But even before Saudi uh, MBS and the Saudis were this antagonistic, which has only been the last four or five years, really, Jamal, it's really been the Israeli tack to try to destabilize Ever since Iraq was destabilized and larger parts of North Africa were destabilized and the Palestinians became completely uh, written out of the equation in terms of, uh, you know, the political dynamics in the Israeli electorate, only then did Iran kind of, you know, spring up as being this really critical, important uh, construct for everybody. Well, I mean, look, part of the story can be looked at it in a very simple term. You know, simply be Trump's desire to reverse the work of the Obama administration. Absolutely. His obsession to reverse anything that was done by President Obama, which basically inked the JCPOA uh, agreement with Iran, right? And at the same time, we know that up till now he has failed to create any sort of uh, any success with North Korea. He keeps talking about this. We have nothing. It's just like he made that trip. Yeah, we're buddies. We connected together. There is that love fest, but nothing, right? Right. And, and so there is that shift. To me, you said half the story. And half the story is, and this has been for a long time, the Israeli call and desire to destroy basically Iran. Right. Just like they were working from covertly and overtly to destroy Iraq, which they succeeded. Syria. You know, and other countries. But there is that call, and of course there are surrogates in Congress and other, other people who have this desire because they feel that Iran poses the only risk. I mean, look at the rest of the Middle East. The, it, the all major Arab countries are either have been neutralized like Egypt. There is a peace agreement between Israel and Egypt has its own issues. So they're not have, they are not worried uh, about the threat from Egypt. Syria is uh, embroiled in this destabilized. So they're not worried there. You know, there's a minor threat from Hezbollah, but Hezbollah does not have an air force. Hezbollah, you know, can cause a damage, but 
they're not a large country like Iran. So there is that threat. So every time Iran does something or there is, uh, comes closer to a deal or there is a rapprochement between Iran and the West, not just the United States, they'll make up some story and they'll say, you know, like recently, the attack on the Saudi tankers in the, in, in the Gulf, they are the making of Iran. So we're all, they'll always go after Iran to vilify it. And basically, during the Obama administration, Netanyahu tried so hard to have the United States bomb That's right. basically Iran, and Obama said no way and managed to ink that, that agreement. Against, by the way, the deep uh, hostility of Benjamin Netanyahu yes, and the Israelis. and Congress. And Congress. You know, that they invited him right. you know, to right. address a joint session right. and, and basically humiliate the president of the United States. This is a well-known fact. The other fact that people don't know about, and I think it has to do with Islamophobia. And I know that the Trump administration and everyone that Trump surrounded himself with, they all believe that Islam is a religion or it poses a unique threat to the United States, which basically colors their foreign policy. Absolutely. So to them, even though we have, I mean, Iran is a functioning country. It has maybe, it, it's not a perfect country. We know it has its own issues, but it's actually almost a self-sufficient country no, it, yeah. with a long history. Absolutely. And, and, and by the way, it wasn't too long when we had a good relationship with Iran. With the Shah of Iran. And we're the ones who introduced the nuclear technology, the first reactors. Well, French, France and us, yeah. Uh, you know, so against, think about that, against this crazy regime of North Korea. Right. You know, going back to the father and the grandfather, and we say, these are, meaning the those Iranian Muslims, they're the bad guys. And, oh, look at this darling, beautiful baby, Kim. <laughs> we can get along, you know. It's kind of right. like that statement uh, that was right. said. Uh, who said that? Like, Bush, I looked into Putin's eyes. And, and I saw his soul. I saw his soul, <laughs> and I fell in love. It's the same story. It's kind of well, ridiculous and ridiculous I, to think about it. Yeah. Even. Can I just, I want to just clarify one thing, because I think your analysis is really very, very true. Rather than just say flat out Islamophobia, can we just say selective Islamophobia, Jamal? And I'll tell you why. Just this week, we found out that the Trump administration, in two separate secret agreements, had agreed for Saudi Arabia to develop nuclear technology. So I, I just think it's kind of interesting in terms of this larger geopolitical puzzle of vilifying Iran, coming hard on Iran, economic sanctions on Iran, you know, because of their scary, you know, Muslim country that has nuclear uh, capabilities. They're now secretly giving the Saudis the green light to develop their own nuclear technology. And by the way, it's interesting. Um, it looks like that there might be some pushback on that and I think it's because of Islamophobia, pushback on that from the senators, even Republican senators, who don't want the Saudis to, ha you know, to have this kind of and, nuclear technology. And we have technology. to say, nuclear technology, that's very limited as far as uh, power, For medical power purposes. plants and yeah, medical yeah, pur yeah. purposes to distinguish this. But and, and, and this is easy. It's just, you know why? Because this is something like selling Iran. And of course, this is a, uh, this is a business transaction, just like selling selling them F-16s and whatever. Absolutely. You know, but Iran is different because Iran has the scientists. That's right. And that's has right. the know-how and the knowledge and et cetera. And the reactors. And the reactors. And Saudi Arabia does not have this. So, right. So it's just a money transaction. I really believe it's a two-part thing. It's the Israeli pressure, and especially under Benjamin Netanyahu, to basically destroy Iran. Absolutely. Just like they've destroyed Iraq. And then the other thing, this administration is driven by their Islamophobic tendencies, and they're looking at Iran versus and, and North Korea, and they're just vilifying the Muslims. Right, and let's not forget that uh, uh, John Bolton, 
for decades now has it's been his mission to try to undermine the sovereignty and integrity of Iran. He's been he's been a he ha, this has been one of his major after what he did in Iraq once Iraq was destroyed and destabilized he went immediately to Iran. I mean, he's been on this for 20 plus years, Jamal. So, you know, I guess uh you know, it should be no surprise to anybody who has any sense of history that this agenda, you know, is also being pushed by uh, John Bolton. Hey, we only have a few minutes left. I want to say something that we'll probably talk about next week, and that's about the the situation in the Sudan right now, which I guess has gotten worse because they just this week found the bodies of 100 protesters in the Nile. That's right. And really disturbing because the protesters in Sudan managed to get uh, major, uh, major, uh, uh, you know, victories with having, you know, Bashir step down and the head of the military step down and there being an interim kind of transition period where there can, you know, our hope be true sovereignty for the Sudanese people to run their country. And it looks like this interim a uh, group that's trying to manage the transition uh, still has a lot of um, people from the Bashir regime, and they are slowly and carefully assassinating, killing, executing uh, the leadership of the Sudanese um, kind of popular uprising. So we want to make sure that we uh, are able to report on that next time. We'll definitely report on this, and hopefully uh, we have been trying to extend, we've extended an invitation to a Sudanese fellow, uh, fellow meaning uh, research fellow research fellow at yeah. UC Berkeley, and depending on his time, just we might have him right here all right. in the studio. All right. Well, thank you all for listening today. This has been Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. You can get our podcast from uh, iTunes. Go to our website, arabtalkradio.com, and you can basically select the podcast that you want to subscribe to it, again, for free. Uh, We don't charge. We don't charge for (laughs) that. So uh, we will talk to you next week. This is Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco. 89.5 89.5 FM.